Welcome everyone. Second try, second try, twice a charm. Of course, talking about Linux innovation and stuff. Desktop Linux 2019 and yes, pulls audio. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And how does it happen? Actually, I had to restart my X server. I left this amazing, certainly ThinkPad here on over the night because why not? And uh, somehow OBS couldn't do the screen capturing, had a bunch of GL warnings, can't bind GL, whatever. And so after figuring can't fix anything, I restarted X server and then five minutes later <laughs> you stream and you stream without audio. Anyway, welcome everyone to this amazing, hopefully now with audio, live stream. And for those who are new to this channel, we are actually here huge fans of Linux or at least historically done for 20 years since 1998 Rock Linux invented by Clifford Wolf then contributed their stable release maintainer eventually became T2 nowadays known as T2 so huge Linux fans here and contributors from the Linux kernel to uh, everything patches from myself back in the day 20 years even GIMP 0. Point whatever to Chrome or Linux kernel, glibc, gcc, you name it. Certainly in the, with the work with T2, the open source source distribution or system development environment to create your specific embedded target or virtually virtualized machine images stuff. I touched a lot of things. I have seen most things, meaning this cross-compiling to PowerPC, Spark, ARM, MIPS usually something failed. I had to look through a lot of code. So over the years, I it's probably fair to say that nearly every or at least every second package of those um, nearly 4,000, I guess, in T2, I unpacked, patched something over the years for Spark, PowerPC, whatever failed left and right. Even recently, um, not only did I two monster live streams, seven hours or so, KDE, Qt and Gnome updates there in T2. So even on that front, back in the day, even there I packaged and run KDE and GNOME, um, or GNOME, whatever. And um, yeah, so I've seen a lot of stuff, certainly 20 years, um, not too little. And I'm getting a little bit frustrated with the progress of desktop Linux or all the surrounding architecture. And if you want to add any comment here, so this is not of some Windows fanboy. Certainly I uh, used Windows um, not professionally or uh, in, in any reasonable form since 1995 or something. So I grew up on Linux for the most part just the last decade, actually a little bit macOS stuff on the desktop, but macOS has also peaked bugs, not a fan of that anyway. So I'm not neither a Mac or Windows fanboy and just wanted to share from actually in like 90% Linux focused experience that um, after 20 years, I think we should be all more critical and think and evaluate where we are in, um, in this kind of computer science development. And fun fact, recently um, when I was sitting with a friend in Berlin um, with some beer and such on the weekend, he actually said like, are not like all problems like solved. What do we even have to do in like IT? And so I was looking at him like, what all problem? All things are solved uh, with all the security nightmare, not only spectrum mitigation, but also X and Linux kernel, like basically everything glibc um, security stuff left and right. So I was like, there you see how different the perception can be, right? One person working commercially IT administration, infrastructure stuff, like are not all problems solved. We just deploy Xen, QEMU, um, Kubernetes, whatever, Docker, and yeah, problem solved. And I like, wait, what? <laughs> with, with all the issues left and right. So um, I hope um, during the live, live stream, by the way, it can't be too long because I'm running on battery power. So camera may eventually die. That is good for you. We can't talk forever today. And if you have any comments, um, why do I come to this conclusion? So I usually already along the lines criticized a little bit like yeah, the 1000 Linux distributions. And if you look on this amazing scalable vector graphic chart here from Wikipedia, then 
Yeah. And I was actually wondering if they have Rock Linux NT2 and this, this graph is so, long, uh, so large. You see this is 100% zooming of Linux distributions and this graph is so large I scrolled a little bit on this and for like two minutes I couldn't find T2 and Rock Linux and lo and behold it's even there. Look, Rock somewhere. Um, I found it a couple of... Uh, you see even... but this is of course the benefit of SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. You can actually search in that just that uh, it's not so easy to see where is the highlighted text in this. Anyway, we probably can also search for T2 and there we have it. And yeah, Rock Linux. Actually, I thought we were a little bit earlier. So yeah, our unsuccessful one-man distribution. Here you have it live on Wikipedia. And uh, yeah, the dates are relatively oh, relatively right here. This is 1990. Yeah, actually, I think it could be slightly earlier, but whatever. Relatively right tish and they have not deleted it as there. And if you look on the sheer amount of Linux distributions, not only is it obvious that how should normal Joe users at home or in companies pick a Linux distribution? Yes, of course. Uh, 900 of those are like small hobby projects like our T2. Nobody is using this, but even if you take the major system that maybe 10 major systems or something, even there, if there would be, in my opinion, if, but correct me if I'm wrong, if there would be like one major system that more people would agree upon using and, and stuff, I think this would be more successful. And, um, but this is not everything what I wanted to say. I wanted to say mostly if you think about the amount of time that people put in there, like people from uh, Deborah and I in there from Debian and everyone else from Slackware to Red Hat and Rock Linux and, and everything in between. This millions of hours of work and most do mostly the same, right? They all update the packages like even I've done here a couple of times live on YouTube. And everyone is repeating the same work, right? And not only this, then people of course invent failing stuff like Pulse Audio and SystemD that spark controversy and people are not happy and contribute to even more forks like if you have not, had not in, in, uh, enough, too many Debian forks already, then with SystemD you of course have more. And also with desktop environments, right? So many desktop environments. Yes, choice is certainly good, but if you think about this, I have to wonder if it would not be for this kind of crazy, enormous amount of monstrous, basically, humongous amounts of Linux distribution labyrinth here. If people, instead of creating an own Linux distribution, would have done something else, like doing like real research and development. And that, that is the stuff, right? That is the thing. Doing Linux distribution is a totally low-hanging fruit. Like everyone can do this, right? You just take Debian and copy um, copy Debian to, to uh, whatever, uh, Fred and uh, on Tilly distribution and you have it. And this is, of course, instead of, and of course, I understand it. If you, which you see on my channel, we do some low level code also for 3D graphics and stuff, Voodoo Verge and other fun stuff that we have recently done, just to prepare also your education to get into drivers and how stuff work. And of course, it's a low hanging fruit, right? You have all the drivers in Linux, uh, 10,000 of them, and you don't need to write them, right? You, you just use it. But what are the consequences? The consequences are that all the Linux distributions are basically the same. They only have a different package manager. They have a little bit configuration. Maybe they ship mplayer compiled with MMX uh, or of course nowadays it's not MMX anymore. <laughs> so far, of course, um, AVX uh, 512 and whatnot, single instruction, multiple data, um, another package manager, maybe a little bit more colorful, maybe a few options less or a few options more, and then you call it day and call it an operating system. And I want to motivate people with this channel and certainly even myself because T2 will not go away. So if you're just new to T2 and want to try it on your P3 or Octane or just your amazing ThinkPad, then you do not need to worry. I will not stop doing T2. 
um, it's automated enough. However, I, as you see from this channel, after 20 years, I also want to do some real development and research again and not only package other people bullshit, aka systemd or failing pulse audio. And this is what, um, if you think there on the weekend and you think, how does all the IT scene, open source scene, culture and stuff develop? And where should we maybe explore more? In my opinion, maybe we should explore real new research. And certainly there is amazing stuff coming, right? Not only massive parallel multi-threaded multi-core systems, there's also this persistent memory from Hewlett Packard and others, this uh, as fast as memory, but if you switch off power, you still retain the state. Certainly, why do I say this? I could just keep this for myself, try to make some startup, maybe I will some other day, but also to inspire you, right? So maybe for this persistent, persistent memory stuff, maybe it is worth to develop completely different operating systems, right? Because you do not have the suspend resume. If you, you switch off the power, you have all your super fast, persistent, random access memory content. And maybe it's also time to really develop something entirely different, like instant on, instantly different. Um, maybe the whole system is a database. I don't know. There are certainly plenty of ideas to explore there. And um, But even unrelated to this, if I take a look, you see today I wanted to stream OpenGL failed overnight, Pulse Audio failed. Maybe the infrastructure is also not the most amazing. And um, also fun fact this morning, of course, doing the regular T2 updates. Linux is, in my opinion, not the most innovative, right? When Linux Torvald started this in 1990, around 1990, it it was an old concept, right? So this Unix was old. So it was even back in the day, um, he was just copying other Unix systems paradigm or some like all the architecture and, and implementation basically. And it's like, for the most part, in, in my opinion, but correct me if I'm wrong, Linux has barely ever innovated anything well, loadable, loadable modules, but yeah, even those you had in other commercial Unix, maybe not as snappy, but certainly they were especially later there. But also even loadable modules or some proc file system or dev file system, it's nothing like that wasn't seen at other systems. So in my opinion, for the most part in the Linux kernel, tell me one thing, maybe the biggest innovation were things like kernel virtual machine stuff, but that certainly was just a development of its time Certainly, well, you could even without KVM in the Linux kernel, you have seen on other platforms, you can implement hardware, um, hardware assisted, accelerated virtual, virtual machines with the instructions. And again, this hardware instructions in x86 were not put there by Intel or AMD for Linux innovation sake, just because the vendors wanted to speed up certainly VMware or something like that. But if you have extremely innovative concepts that were innovated in the Linux kernel, please leave me below. Can't really think of too many. And then you have this in 2019, right? And we had this again, I called this out. I find the level of professionalism that it's, it's basically looks, if you look at this Linux 5 to 13, fun fact, I think I updated this already this morning in our unsuccessful T2 distribution, we can actually just check. I do so much each day that uh, it might not yet be updated, but I think I committed it already. In any case, um, at least I typed this on the server already. And what do I mean with this? I mean that, in my opinion, for one of the industry leading operating systems that Linux, of course, is in the server space or even mobile space, it's hilarious that we have reoccurring this kind of emergency stable releases because I was updating this. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm one of those who actually reads over the changelog, at least scrolls over it to see what happened. And I even in another live stream called out already how much stuff was reverted, even in the sta stable series. It's hilarious for an industry flagship leading operating system that in, in, even in a stable patch series, and I said this before already that I think they probably put too much stuff in there, like random changes that 
probably in my opinion, should not even be there. And here again, another example of random changes. Input Elantech, not even that too many would um, use this specific touchscreen. It's not like 2019 is the year of desktop Linux or something. But yeah, so they, they just pulled in a patch in, two, in 5 to 12 and they already instantly, within, within an hour or something, reverted this. I mean, seriously, um, this is actually what I have here, my IT news um, face palm for, right? And um, this is reoccurring, right? This is not like once, it is happening constantly. And also my recurring shout out, I would much more prefer a microkernel these days, even already 20 years ago, I grew up reading Intel architecture manuals and were actually with uh, privilege rings there already syncing with ring 0 to 3 and the Intel even in the manual mapped this out as drivers and subsystems. It was for me like naturally especially coming from the instability that was DOS. I grew up with DOS and Windows and we actually delayed using Windows because it was so instable and we continued using DOS with our final level stuff that it was clear to me with this instability at hand it makes sense to isolate drivers and inf subsystems like storage and network and stuff and with this kind of uh, microkernel system not that I'm saying this is the only choice of course there are plenty of choices but this kind of stuff we would not even have right you would have in a in my opinion more sorted architectural separated way have your subsystems update independently of this kind of stuff. So yeah, here is this. This is uh, September the 6th, September the 6th, 12th. So yeah, with, uh, within two hours, they um, they reverted this. And I already made fun out of revert. Yeah, and even this, you see, I don't even need it. Even in 5 to 12, it starts with revert ASOC fail card instantiation in DAI uh, format setup fails. And of course there's more revert uh, config 80 2011 fix processing world rec domain were not modular. Of course we have more memory management but partially revert uh, keep local VM counters in sync with hierarchical ones. And yeah, I, it's, it's, uh, I don't even need, need to make this stuff up, right? I don't even need to search long. It's not like I need to prepare for this live stream, well, like, except syncing with a good wine in the evening and thinking about the advancements in the next step in computer science. But you see, I don't even need to, wait a second, I uh, wrong focus here. Don't even need to search long and uh, even more, of course, revert NFS. And this is just one stable. This is just, it's a low hanging fruit, right? I just opened the last stable release and it's revert, revert, revert. And um, for people who get hundreds of thousands of salary, and I said this already, I was surprised to find that Linus Torvalds even earns uh, over a million a year with uh, base salary and other pension compensation. In my opinion, they could a little bit less aggressively shout with each other and instead focus on not causing so many regressions to revert. Um, especially for in the development series, okay, granted you do random stuff. Well, you should maybe not do random stuff, but they do random stuff. But in a development series, yeah, okay, well, maybe. But hey, we are talking about the stable bug fixes. And in my opinion, I said this before, why do they even pull so much stuff in there? I heard from someone, I've not, I probably should research this, that they use some artificial intelligence to filter their hundreds, thousands, if, if not millions of commits for keywords and pull them in automatically because so many random changes, they already allegedly maybe even need some automatic filtering for that. But, well, of course there were uh, some other operating system research, I only wanted to say maybe there is a chance that, I would probably say it's fair enough, there is the thousand, the thousand Linux distribution certainly took a huge part away of real, not like just copying another distribution, but real sophisticated development and research. And you could say, hey, René, why do you not sit down then and write a microkernel the whole day? Yeah, also need to earn a living and um, anyway, can't just do this, right? Um, 
but we will be getting there and um, all this red is closer to stable no yeah exactly um, my point uh, also in a, in my opinion so also the linux kernel folks like linux torvalds and friends and family they always say this micro kernel and by the way fun fact of course minix the first version of minix in the 80s micro kernel already certainly not the most amazing but at least micro kernel research right um, was written before Linux and certainly this is historic fact that um, Linux even announced the Linux kernel as yeah I'm doing this hobby here not as big as Minix and not sophisticated and is it not hilarious that in the 1990s a student copies uh, some old-fashioned legacy stuff and that becomes the world's most used operating system and not some real more modular fine-grained more secure stuff so basically in the 1990s we had already more fine-grained architecture potentially more secure microkernel stuff than um, what was copied there and i could also i wanted but the problem is if i talk about each detail which we could of course try if you look at this of course in in my opinion the linux kernel is not the most modern code right so even if you look into this in my opinion you probably don't really want to write an operating system in uh, what do we click on here something this is really old-fashioned c code right and like without well it's like pseudo object oriented in c in some sort of sense but like no you can't even use very low hanging fruits like default arguments for what you could use in c plus plus or other or like like real Oper not like C manually type, but like at least a little bit sugar coated stuff of C++. Not that I'm implying that C++ is the most amazing language, maybe, but in my opinion, probably it would make maintenance maybe a little bit easier and maybe a little bit error prone, uh, less error prone. And certainly there's also Rust and whatever, many other possibilities, which is what I mean with killing this development and research. So yeah, totally old fashioned C code, um, but um, it just opened here, maybe not the very best example, but you probably get the idea. And um, of course there was some development. I mentioned a couple of things already before. If you take a list, here's of course uh, a long list of operating systems. Well, starting obviously at, well, starting alphabetically sorted, not the most historically correct way here, of course, but yeah, there was Risk OS from our current computers, Amiga, of course. Amiga, I have to say, I totally undervalued. I only saw this Amiga at my neighbors there back in the day in the 80s playing games. The games looked amazing. I always like thought Amiga is not an as sophisticated operating system as a PC with DOS. Boy, was I wrong, of course. But um, nonetheless, it certainly didn't caught on or continued in this kind of, even back in the day, like cooperative microkernel multitasking system, graphical even in relatively high performance. There are of course a lot of stuff, even I'm surprised that Apple had so many stuff that is listed here where they had something that was GNOME, that is interesting, didn't even GNOME multitasking environment, what the heck. First time I see this. This is also why I make these live streams. I can sit in a dark corner and review the stuff myself and not tell anyone, but maybe it's certainly interesting for you also to learn something new. And uh, actually this is the first time I see this. Of course I knew about the Lisa, not that I have ever seen this in the wild. I heard about Copland, MK Linux, of course, if you're interested, this was uh, Mach Multi Microkernel Linux done by Apple before they purchased, purchased Next. Um, I've even made a video, so not that I make this stuff up. Some of the stuff I've seen or heard or seen, I tested this a little bit. Probably we will continue just for the fun of it with the 8100 Macintosh first gen PowerPC Mac here on my channel, certainly there a year ago or something. Rhapsody, macOS, and um, yeah, certainly then all the stuff that came after macOS based on Darwin. And then here is the stuff like real operating system research, right? BOS that people already here in the audience asked me to test Haiku. Yes, I've tested this already 
uh, years ago. There, so BOS, I probably, I even back in the day, I purchased a copy. It's, I said this already, I somehow lost it wherever it disappeared. BOS personal edition, something for probably 199 Deutschmark or something. BOS certainly a really nice multimedia system. I was so impressed with Windows and even probably I used Linux back in the day already. And BOS, of course, looked amazing, performed amazing. And this is what I mean, like with how much innovation do we lose with people just doing Linux distributions? And yes, it is so much easier, of course. You do not need to study computer science or even if not at the university, not at home with reading a book or reading source code. You can, of course, just copy it, rename it and call it Gentoo. No problem. And um, yeah, then, of course, all the Bell stuff and uh, Unix uh, stuff here from back in the day. Uh, just scrolling over the stuff here, CPM and uh, DOS, of course, here of this old fame. Then digital, of course, uh, all the VMS goodness and stuff. And of course, most of, the, of them I've never heard. Of course, I've, I've not, also I have PA risk. I've like nearly this one in my older videos, if you're interested in all this fun vintage Unix gear, plenty of stuff to find on my channel that you can watch at night or weekend or travel, fun stuff. Even then, I've not seen most of this year ever. Of course, stuff I knew in principle, VMS and so on. Of course, you see VMS. Um, there was research and stuff. Yeah, Google. I mean, it's just a little bit funny, like Chromium, like, yeah, based Android, like, yeah, based on the Linux kernel, right? Um, I will just one second. Ah, here's actually fun fact. They have your uh, Harmony, Huawei Harmony OS. This is actually interesting. That's we have already an article. So they have basically here more articles than is visible in out in the wild, maybe. Interesting stuff. Of course, IBM, a lot of stuff, not only there, well, OS 360 uh, and also CP, MS, Unix like, yeah, AX. Fun fact also, I have a IBM PowerPC. I never used this, right? So I could have like tested AIX, or however you pronounce it in English. Um, on my B50, for example, that I have also old PowerPC stuff, so much to watch on my video, or, uh, on my channel already. And yeah, I've, I've usually didn't bother at all because I was a Linux guy, right? So there you see it. I run Linux on everything and yet after 20 years I have to really evaluate, is this for the future, was this a historic mistake to invest so much time and effort into this without any real progress? Because basically I've we are running here today, Linux still the same as I have done already 20 years ago, like nearly nothing changed. Graphics still sucks. We have a couple of different graphics drivers. They sometimes work, sometimes well. I have to say, they are also quite good. But honestly, we had back in the day, I brought a Matrox card just because it was best supported in Mesa. So basically nothing changed on this front anyway. Back in the day, you had like three and a half cards that you can use. I don't even... Mesa, maybe the ATI R200, not sure if it came first or last. Then there was a couple of half working Mesa drivers, maybe. But there you also see rewritten, rewritten, rewritten. We had um, the first Utah GLX, then I don't even remember all the, this is 3D stuff. So Utah GLX was some indirect GL, GL OpenGL, not very high performance, but at least it worked to some degree. Um, and then all the DRI rewrites and direct rendering and I don't know how many incarnations we had of uh, this stuff and with each rewrite drivers were lost and instability was gained until it settled down a couple of years ago. We see this with Wayland, right? How many years is Wayland around the corner? And um, yeah, comments in the audience, Amiga OS had uh, 13, 13 ish Okay, microkernel, everything else was modular, those guys had the right idea, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I will say another thing, uh, if I don't forget this until I'm reaching there. PC DOS, of course, I've seen this back in the day. Um, OS2, of course, um, fun fact, neighbors, the, the parents of the neighbors were working at some German bank. They had OS2 at home, otherwise I've barely ever seen this, but of course OS Warp 4 back in the day, I never installed it personally, I've seen it at some people. Unlike, by the way, fun fact, Macintosh, I've not seen a Macintosh until 2000 something in the poor areas of Germany where most people couldn't afford a Mac. I probably barely ever heard about this. 
so much to that in Western Germany. But OS2 I've seen and OS Warp 4 I was really impressed. It has built-in speech recognition from IBM VR Voice fame and uh, actually so not too bad on that front and at least for all the of course OS2 was quite stable, had quite some compatibility with uh, Windows and DOS and the native OS2 stuff and the most innovative maybe in 1996 or whenever that was built-in speech recognition super impressive so basically 20 years before Siri or something of that sort I really wish, well not that I'm the greatest fan of IBM but maybe we would have well, the, the future, like today, would certainly be a vastly different one if Microsoft would not have been so dominant and maybe IBM would have continued OS2 because the Swap 4 release certainly was a qu quite interesting one. Yeah, AS400. Um, we are getting to some more interesting stuff. Yeah, of course, also boring crap from Microsoft. The so 500 zillion versions of uh, Windows, Monta Vista, Mobile Linux. Interesting, let's say, yeah, next, next step. Netware, all the fun stuff. Um, but now comes some, yeah, actually here, some Lisp stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, Lisp machines. Also, also there, that, there you see back in the day when people like really innovated, like really tried new stuff, like Lisp and Smalltalk and so on. And now we are coming, um, yeah, actually forgot this already, <laughs> with all the uh, good old stuff here, Sun Microsystems, Sun Solaris, and um, of course, also uh, SGI from all the, you see it, me personally, idiot trying to install IREX was a fun ride, not that easy. So now we come to the interesting non-proprietary ones and here you see, yes, it didn't kill all innovation, admittedly. There was some innovation and a lot of stuff I've heard or mentioned already, L4, Barrelfish from Microsoft, um, Haiku, well not really like innovation, just reprogramming reinventing um, what was there already but starting from Minix of course everyone probably should know this also BSDs um, the BSDs I do not find too noteworthy in my opinion the code base even more legacy like even more simple C than Linux probably and um, yeah comments in the audience we would still have IBM ThinkPads and not the <laughs> yes. I know, but fun fact, still the best PC laptop, oh, still the best laptops, right? I mean, the Macs are unusable and p keyboards and ports and stuff. And yeah, anyway, still the best on the market, probably. I wish they, you can always still room for improvements, but whatever. So the BSDs, for the most part, NetBSD, OpenBSD, just like really keep it stupid simple. Um, not as high performant, but certainly more stable and more portable, just because less features, less code base. And this is why I'm not the most impressed about them. And yes, I've tried them back in the university. I had friends, they were huge freebies defense. And there you see how important it is to keep an open mind and not always, like I said in the other live stream and previous live streams, for example, with Lua, the programming language, that initially I wasn't impressed. The comments I find alien and uh, other stuff. And it took some years to grow on me up to the point that nowadays we use it in our products. Um, and so the BSDs I, at university, I had friends, they're huge fans of uh, FreeBSD. And it's always, I can only encourage you, keep your eyes open, take a look left and right. Um, often new things to learn, um, to advance and so on. The, from the BSD family, what I at least from, but always leave me in the comments below what you think. What I find the most impressive from the BSD family is Dragonfly BSD. I tried this already three, four, five years ago, at least on virtual machines. Um, it is some kind of uh, hybrid. I think they say I still need to evaluate um, how much of its fork from FreeBSD, but they write here, I think hybrid micro kernel, yeah, here, kernel type hybrid. Um, I need to review exactly what exactly they mean with that how much microkernel it really is because macOS is also hybrid with the Darwin um, Mach microkernel and Darwin GNU, uh, GNU BSD user land. But what I've seen in Darwin is that mostly they use it as a the Mach microkernel as a portability abstraction and basically everything, nearly everything from macOS is running in one BSD kernel task that is certainly not amazing for, well, so amazing for catching up with 
performance a little bit. Of course, Mach, the one of the slowest, first, earliest, slowest microkernel, not impressed. Um, what is faster? I called this out already the L4 family, that is a second or so generation, the much more faster, um, much lower context switching time, and so on. Um, there you see that over the years I always did some research and stuff. Uh, 10 years already, so this is not a recurring, uh, this is not a new theme, right? Already 10 years ago, a decade, decade ago, when I found it exact code in the, even probably in retrospect, now that I think about this, probably when I found it exact code in 2006 or something, boy, is my company getting old. Already more than 10 years going. Um, back in the day, I was already considering that maybe something more microkernel again is more maintainable, more secure, more stable. And I played already around with a fourth family of microkernels. And um, yeah, I know the graver calls out that uh, Matt Matthew Dillon is known from Amiga fame. Yeah, I read this from uh, his, his reviews there. His articles probably need a microwave here next to the studio that I can always keep the coffee warm already. Getting fresh. Anyway, um, yeah, of course, Android not impressed, just some Java user lens stuff with Linux kernel, something. I'm really, I'm really um, wondering that Google never got the idea to get some more portable, maintainable, setup of microkernel stuff with the, with the Linux kernel for the Android stuff. But yeah, probably innovation not very high on the Google list there. He opens the Laris, obviously. Uh, also, there is an, there were, I think, two open Darwin projects, like was it pure Darwin and or first open Darwin, maybe even from Apple people and then pure Darwin or something. Um, probably like once or twice I tried to install it. Um, but anyway, in my, in my pine point, um, in, in probably it, it's not the best time spent with this old slowest Mach microkernel, probably the same with, by the way, even GNU Hurt also as nearly soon as long Vaporware and coming soon as well, and certainly GNU Hurt, the exactly Mach based multi-server microkernel stuff that is already in the states of soon being ready or something. But yeah, if only for people work on this and then with the slow Mach microkernel, um, but even probably heard, I tried probably even 20 years ago. So when we got into Linux and Rock Linux, I probably tried GNU heard from some magazine CD with back in the day when you didn't only had a V90 modem analog line and you downloaded everything with 56K baud or something, KBit. And yeah, then you were relying on magazine CDs to try something out for the most part anyway. Yeah, Haiku. And of course, we had some stuff like Syllable Desktop and yeah, Temple OS people already calling out here. And here we have a Temple OS, React OS, of course, but React OS only a one-to-one -one copy of Windows for the most part. Anyway, free DOS, yeah. The Gnode, I know, Gnode, they are based on L4. I have not taken a closer look, maybe I should, but I, from the news articles from Moronix and OS News, I have a little bit the impression they slow everything, uh, uh, they throw everything into the kitchen sink and mix everything together. Like, in it, at least from the news summary, um, I would guess it is like this if the news summary already reads like this, but correct me if I'm wrong. I don't really like projects too much if they just throw everything together in the hope that something sticks. That's a little bit my outside impression. But you see with the list of systems, um, this is why I try to build the YouTube channel, right? We will most likely take a closer look in some of them, like certainly Haiku, because that is what the audience like you already asked me to. Certainly Dragonfly BSD, because it personally for me is one of the more reasonable looking architectures or developments. And um, yeah, also there is some stuff written in C++ like OSV, some unikernel, but unikernel meaning it's running in one unified address space for like virtualization. They even write it here without bare metal drivers, only for use with virtual drivers like virtio, block and network for high performance virtualized containers. Maybe not the worst idea. And certainly this is what we will most likely also try soon uh, with my repository of uh, creating this Rosetta 
stone kind of infrastructure of drivers of code of examples of how to program stuff probably so not only we will we have this low level DOS stuff for Verge Voodoo um, now a little bit of in Linux testing for the Silicon Motion Link 3D because just why not and then we will also have directly bootable stuff on bare metal and virt.io stuff sometime soon and um, yeah you see there is a little bit stuff here also there was a uh, um, Möbia also from Andreas Tenbaum as far as I remember this was a um, distributed system yeah distributed operating system and um, probably I read something about this and um, so, but this is also old, right? So this was, I think, in the 90s or something. Is it written there? Probably not. Um, but yeah, so there was a couple of stuff, as you see. Also, there was Barrelfish from Microsoft. Is it even Barrel? No. Sellyfish? No. It's interesting, they don't even have Barrelfish in there. So much too, I've done my research, barrel fish, MS, and yeah, barrel fish, so probably could add, edit your life uh, on YouTube. The list of this was an experimental, so even Microsoft is doing experimental research, right, together with even European universities here, ETH Zurich, as, uh, with assistance of Microsoft Research, and you see also microkernel, you see innovation is happening. I think this was even some multi, um, where do they write this? Multi something like multi uh, CPU stuff, maybe. Where would this be written? Microkernel, yada yada, under development, maybe. Multi core processor reducing something, putting lower level hardware information in data. What? Database? Let's say, what? What the heck? Uh, what? You had me a database and necessary of driver software, what the heck, goal of reducing, uh, interesting, didn't really remember that part, but um, anyway, so there was some stuff, but just like myself, right, so much time, so basically like 30% of my life the last 20 years, I certainly kept like updating stuff, just the other day, not only have I ruined, and also the stuff is not amazing, right, the other months with virtual uh, uh, KVM, QEMU testing for VGA pass-through, of course, it usually didn't work amazingly. Of course, it was maybe also partially my fault. Yeah, actually, so with the AMD card, it worked somewhat, but I, the AMD card, uh, old crap, uh, well, not, not that old, but low entry-level crap, uh, RX 560D, just the cheapest crap to have some test stock there that worked to some degree, but I wanted a second card. It didn't, it didn't work to post to the EFI BIOS in QEMU. This is why I ordered a five or nine dollar or something of that sort Matrox card from eBay, PCIe, and I didn't know that you can't reset them all. So basically, this card with QEMU it didn't like reset. It's of course hilarious, right? So this this like crashed my whole Linux with kernel-based virtual machine stuff, and after a couple of times, so this I like crashed and reset it a couple of times. And after like the fourth or fifth time, my LVM2, I had some three disk LVM2 write with SSD caching. And this metadata stuff got out of sync. I totally I made a video there. Total hilarious. It's also a lesson learned. Um, also, if something starts crashing, really make sure you have a backup. Although it was a test system. Although I had there some YouTube raw video material on there. So it was like half production, not as important data. But yeah, if something starts crashing, make a backup and maybe don't do it something even if you have half production. And this was expected, as expected, the battery of the camera. So much to not using a webcam. Anyway, um, 
there's someone here, I hope. And um, yeah, that was a battery, not to blame, pulled all you, but I said this in the very beginning of the live stream, we can't live stream too much today, but yeah, now we have the second battery in the camera. Um, and um, yeah, so even with LVM, so not only am I not impressed that this metadata, it was like a pure, like, like instant crash lockup thing. It, I find it hilarious that, by the way, maybe leave me in the comments below of the audio, but you probably can check this if it's not stuttering and clipping and whatnot. Um, so not only not impressed that this does not, uh, that this failed at all. Probably, yeah. I hope it's okay anyway. Um, all is fine, all great. So not only was I impressed that this LVM2 got metadata out of sync, like so one, I couldn't even boot, right? So this is also hilarious, right? I, I did not know, and probably you also not, that if you, by the way, leave me in the comments below, do you lose, use LVM2 or Unraid? Or it's also, I said this also before already, right? All the open source companies, Red Hat, SUSE and whatnot, and then some new startup kind of stuff comes there and makes this Unraid that Linus Tech Tips and other YouTubers use. A little bit hilarious. Um, but if you see my experience, so not only did this metadata got out of sync with the pure like random lookup stuff, I also wondered that the stuff didn't boot anymore, right? It's hilarious in my opinion that just because some metadata was a little bit out of sync or slightly corrupted maybe, but mostly out of sync, then your whole Linux machine doesn't boot because it didn't want to take the volumes, the logical volumes up and online because it complaints about some metadata unsync stuff, made videos if you want to see details. And just recently, I uh, just the other night of, of Monday, I pulled a nearly all nighter until like three in the night because I had to get some stuff finished and also finally recovered this. So I was running this like degraded, like there. Nah. And even then when recovering, so I basically reinstalled this with our um, Exacode core node uh, T2 Linux flavor. And then because I installed from an old build from two years ago, it didn't have NV, uh, an NVMe driver with an old kernel 4.16 or whatever, and that didn't have an NVMe in the initRD. And due to that, I couldn't wipe the NVMe SSD cache. And due to this, so I, I wiped all the three disks, the uh, rotating magnetic storage stuff, wiped this, reinitialized this, installed all of this and of course I named the logical volume VG1 volume group 1 or something as I usually do from probably most examples on the internet anyway and to my surprise I booted then to the latest kernel, um, replayed, re replayed the backup, um, rebooted and then it didn't, it didn't boot again because then with the latest kernel and uh, NVMe driver in the init RD it, it saw the SSD that I couldn't wipe and the SSD from the old metadata of course, it had other UUIDs, as the UUIDs are always randomly generated there, but it had the same name, volume volume group zero, right? I mean, obviously, because probably maybe everyone is using VG0, I guess. Um, and yeah, it, again, it, it didn't boot, although I reinitialized everything except the NVMe SSD storage. I mean, this is hilarious. And then it was even proposing yeah, like multiple names of VG0, use some dash dash volume group, select something, whatever, uh, quoting this here from memory, something like that. And that didn't work, right? So then I was sitting there on, on the init RD, like typing uh, VG change dash A, Y. I mean, the syntax is also hilarious, like uh, this active something, yes, like who came up with this syntax? Amazing Linux innovation at its best. And then this didn't even work, like select dash dash, select VG something, and then I typed in even the stupid UUID, I typed off there from the screen, uh, like, you know, super long GUID there, and it didn't even work, right? Then I googled this error message and came uh, came to a Fedora bug, like, hey, my my Fedora system suggests this exactly that, like me, like duplicate volume group name, VG0, and then it was discussed in the bug report already two years ago that this message is misleading, it doesn't work, it's not implemented, like, <laughs> seriously. And this LVM2, so basically this LLVM2 RAID stuff, it should save your work, and also back in the day, the old-fashioned MD, also, yeah, you see, rewritten, rewritten, multi-device support, uh, software, right, 
than LVM1 or LVM2 already for over a decade or 15 years or something. Yeah, rewritten, rewritten, still doesn't work all right. In my opinion, it is hilarious that an operating system doesn't boot just because either the U uh, LVM metadata is out of sync. I mean, the stuff is for redundancy, right? And then you F checking don't boot because your metadata is out of sync. Amazing re redundancy. And then the second is similar hilarious, right? You don't mount, you don't take the volume group active just because there is another spare disk with uh, metadata also referencing a VG0. Can you not take at least the more reasonable or if you have if you have one disk with some old metadata and a new disk that is fully possible to take ac active, you don't take the one that is like obviously it's hilarious and yeah, somehow Linux innovation at its best. And that is my life for 20 years, right? You build with GCC uh, 3, 20 years ago, GCC 2, 95, 3, stuff breaks, glibc, whatever that version was, maybe 1 to 2, I don't know, something of that sort. You rebuild everything, stuff breaks. Um, you, yeah, take some LVM2 online, it breaks and yeah, this is... Um, and after spending multiple nights, one night here with LVM2, one night there with Spark, one night there with MIPS, well, actually a month with MIPS or something. And um, yeah, is this, tell me, is, is am I over dramatizing this or is state in the Linux ecosystem, is it amazing? Am I the only one who has such kind of issues? Also, fun fact, you can't really make this up, right? Um, I could actually Google this uh, LVM2 uh, VG0 duplicate uh, select something. Does it come up or uh, here? Maybe this is actually um, on the server allows duplicate VG names. How can I rename one of the um, yeah, something of that sort? There was a bug report that suggested. Um, yeah, uh, then also you, you see, th this is, I did not even have that, I mean, unable to remove the, it's like, yeah. Um, seems to report wrong precedence when, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, what did I wanted to look up that was, all uh, right. Uh, usually, I'm also not the fan of writing everything in C, right? In my opinion, also, um, just today, probably, if I shout out it now, then is someone using XM here with TLS because new security we just had last month or so, a major security vulnerability in XM. Now we have the next. Uh, say hello to your favorite open coded C stuff with manual array pointer arithmetic there on strings on parsing. And yeah, you guessed it CVE 2019 15 uh, local or remote attacker can execute programs with root privileges. Well done in 2019. Maybe we should really stop writing stuff in C because certainly neither they or I or you or someone, friends and his friends and family, neighbor and such is able to write bug-free C code. Maybe we should stop trying. And if that is a conclusion, then maybe also not write your operating system kernel in C, maybe. And there you have that. But Speaking about this, it is also a little bit hilarious on Linux that all of the command line tools use so different styles of um, programming in, in C and even for argument list and module handling. And this is also so hilarious. So you, you have the LVM2, this is of course a list of one unsuccessful one-man distribution Linux packages here, some 4,000 or so of them. And so you have the regular LVM2 package with most of the stuff. And then for some modern stuff, you need thin provisioning tools. Maybe you have never heard about that one. I also only had heard about this a couple of years ago. Then uh, recently, uh, like a couple of years ago, we started to use SSD caching with uh, LVM DM cache or whatever that is for SSD caching of LVM2 storage. And only after a couple of months, I realized each time we boot, all the cache is reinitialized. Turns out the cache check utility is part of the SYN provisioning tools. I didn't know that either, and I didn't even know that this is, exists until then. And I also wonder why is it not in the LVM2 package? Why does it need to be a SYN provisioning package? However, I have to say this package is not too bad. And there you see other people maybe already intuitively agree with me here because they have written this here in C++ surprisingly. So what 
Lip Ignomi, hello, what's up? <laughs> the first thing I click on it. Yeah, anyway, let's see caching here. Yeah, so this is C++ and so this is more modern code. And I really wonder that the open source, maybe this is also one real mental challenge here that so many people in the open source world are so stuck with C that even I, with my neighbor and me, we already, when we wrote our GSMP and C++ 20 years ago, right, in 1998 or something of that sort, and um, I would not really want to write a real big project in C with all the string handling. It's, it's really my life is too short for that, seriously. Um, in C++ at least you have your standard string and you write there string something plus equals um, some other string like concatenating stuff and parsing stuff. Is the STL amazing? No, it, it, obviously it's not. But in my opinion, it probably would be more amazing even before we had Rust. There you see it now we have Rust. Well, Rust also already soon 10 years old or at least six or something. And why have we not run all, uh, why have we not written most of the Linux command line user space stuff in a little bit more modern way over the last decades? Um, because certainly, well, this is even using Boost, which is interesting. Boost, of course, you probably, many of you know already as C++ additional, like quite standard accepted additional C++ library where a lot of stuff is tested and prototyped before it's getting into the C++ standard now. Nowadays, not some, yeah, some of the stuff is a little bit esoteric there, but yeah, of course, it allows you here, it, I mean, yeah, is this, is this the most amazing formatting I also have my challenges with this because some stuff is, of course, not the super most amazing, but at least because sometimes it's a little bit tricky, right? With with fill and width and hex and decimal and yeah, it's a little, mm. but at least it's quite type safe and quite error, um, less error prone and less buffer over and under run. Like if you do not manual tricks around this, it's, it's of course safe. So, yeah, just some thoughts and yeah, probably this quite fun stuff that very few people of you may or may not have seen. And yeah, this code, of course, uh, yeah, more modern, not sure if it's, um, but leave me in the comments below. Is it more readable? Is it more maintainable? Block manager, pointer, open block manager here, read only. Yeah, at least. Um, also with exceptions, I'm oh, not sure, do they use exceptions? Hey, they throw a runtime error. Yeah, the thing is, of course, with exceptions, but this is certainly a topic for another video that you probably want to share, like, and subscribe for, because otherwise the videos become too long and then nobody watches them and then all the content is mixed. But another video, we could probably discuss error handling, old-fashioned return values versus throwing exceptions. In my opinion, quite beneficial because you can't ignore them. And if something goes wrong with old-fashioned return values, you can just accidentally ignore them and then all kind of crap can, can happen, like LVM metadata get out of sync or something. If you throw an exception, then at least it eventually it aborts and terminates if you don't catch those exceptions. Probably preferable than um, silent data corruption. Anyway, I hope you learned something. All oh, right, I watched, um, actually I have some more thing to say. Uh, do we have more comments? How many people? 12 people. Um, just pointed the video. There is going to be always some innovation. Don't worry about that. Yeah, that, um, thank you for this positive wipe there. Um, that would be good. Well, there was some innovation, but maybe I'm a little bit sad that I would hope there would be more. Um, I would still say, well, there was like Barrelfish L4. There was some innovation. Haiku, well, mostly reprogramming, but yeah. Um, but others, there were, of course, maybe even now Huawei's um, Harmony, if there, if it's more than Vaporware. But one final thought, how long is the stream? Um, final stream links, where are we going? Because um, what I wanted to say is that if you write your own kernel, and this, this is a crux here, really, with... Um, just wonder, should we start a new stream or something? Mm. Because if you write a kernel like 
our microkernel dream here. The real issue is the drivers, right? The problem that most people or companies do not start a complete operating system from scratch nowadays are of course the gazillion drivers. It's not like back in the day you had VGA, Sound Blaster and IDE and that's already mostly it. Nowadays of course you have 100 different IDE controllers over the years. Also it's stupid, right? Why did all the companies had to make them like slightly incompatible and all the DMA bus mastering was different, like seriously, why? Um, I also wish for for VGA cards, I really wish like all stuff was VGA compatible. Why? It's also a little bit of a mysteric, historic mistake in my opinion. It would have been so much more amazing if we would have VGA like compatible 3D stuff. Imagine you would just plug in NVIDIA, ATI, Matrox and, and Intel and S3 and fun stuff and it would just work. They would have the same 3D registers and um, the companies would not have to write drivers. And well, of course, probably a little bit Windows is to blame because with Windows, everyone could hide this behind a driver before there was DOS and all the games had to support them. And then naturally people created like Sound Blaster compatible clones. And with Windows, probably for the most part, because there is the first time they could have drivers hiding all the implementation details. It's probably why we had this explosion of incompatible hardware, I would probably say there to some degree. And um, yeah, uh, Xoyo writes, could always write a kernel with a VM couple of drivers. Yeah, so this is what we probably do. We will, I will soon write virtio example drivers for blocknet and stuff there for this kernel um, innovation stuff, bare metal with DOS, QEMO and stuff. And also this is what I wanted to say. So I initially I s s thought I will not use Linux kernel drivers because then people say, yeah, you only copied this from the Linux kernel. But one thing of course you could do or we could do if we really wanted to experiment with a microkernel eventually like next year or something or this winter sometime between soon and uh, between now and forever, sometime soon. You could of course take your kernel and like microkernel for security and stability and just reuse the Linux kernel drivers, right? And just pull them out um, and even change them. The only thing is then they are usually covered by the GPL, GPL GNU public license. But very theoretically, we could also do this with the BSDs. If you want a BSD licensed kernel or commercially licensed kernel for some reason, you could do this with the BSD drivers from BSD or NetBSD, OpenBSD, uh, Dragonfly BSD. So yeah, you can always reuse them and you could even create a small shim layer of API adoption and um, to just reuse all the hard work of writing the kernel. Well, hard and hard and mostly boring. You have seen me for hours uh, trial and error there on the silicon motion, 3D texturing registers. So it's mostly, in my opinion, it's for the most part not as hard as mostly boring, trying all, all the values and registers and understanding the hardware. But yeah, certainly it is a lot of time spent. So saying it's boring does not mean it's a lot of time. You've seen me over the last 20 years, I reverse engineered 500 scanner drivers in total. But yeah, so you can reuse them even on a microkernel and maybe that's what we're ending up doing because the, the real issue is if we, so say we want to um, create a European mobile system because we don't trust Google anymore and, and Apple's peak bucks and um, maybe scratch some venture capital together and create a real like modern version of mm, microkernel like as more amazing than Linux microkernel with a lot of drivers, we could just reuse them, right? Make a stable microkernel, make a more amazing architecture and just reuse the drivers. Like, and, and by the way, they run in user space, right? So very theoretically, it's like license. I mean, who does even care uh, if it's GPL? I mean, yes, the, the author of Kazit is GPL, but you release the source. You could even make a binary only um, commercial microkernel if you wanted for some commercial reasons. Um, certainly we will anyway publish some open source research here, but just as an example. So it's running in another address space, right? So it's even like I've done all the silicon, if you're interested, not only S3 Verge, 
Voodoo and Silicon Motion Link 3D recently. So the links, so Silicon Motion Link 3D doing hardware isolated 3D where nobody has done it before. I have done in Linux um, in user space, just like old X server drivers. No problem there. And um, yeah, just for the prototyping and drafting. So I'm also actually personally, even on Linux, I'm really wondering that they all run each kind of small garbage in the kernel, like temperature sensors and stuff. In a way, this small low hanging fruit, why have we not already for decades done all the small crap drivers like temperature sensors in user space for all the fan control um, RPM and fun stuff like that. But yeah, on the other hand, they do not crash as often. Um, my example is always a mouse driver, joystick driver, or even keyboard driver, right? Even the keyboard driver uh, indexing there in the key lookup tables, even they can theoretically crash or overwrite something, especially if you plug in an evil um, USB drive that is intentionally hacking around there, um, like sending Ill Ill uh, illegal human interface device packages over USB to just trigger, like even this was, I think, how some P3 was sometimes cracked and stuff, um, as far as I remember anyway. So let's see, come to the audience. Do you think BSD is now, is more secure than Linux? Just curious, I'm not into cybersecurity. I said this the other day, um, just probably yesterday. Um, in my opinion, BSDs are, well, they are, some are a little bit more secure, like of course OpenBSD, because they put more energy and effort into that in code review and stuff, and also the stuff is more simple, right? They have less drivers uh, or simple drivers. In Linux, the drivers maybe do additional tricks, more scatter gathering, DMA stuff uh, for network drivers and stuff um, that OpenBSD might not do as excessively or so. So the drivers often are much simpler and uh, with more simple drivers, less features and less, less throwing everything, mixing it together there in the kitchen sink. Um, of course, you have less attack surface and stuff. So um, probably maybe not as much FreeBSD, certainly OpenBSD, more secure there. And I still need to evaluate Dragonfly BSD, what kind of uh, hybrid kernel they really are. But um, yeah, uh, Dave, let me think we had here. Did I miss uh, Mike Han actually quite some comments scored away. Uh, Haiku, yeah, I mentioned it shortly and we will also test it a little bit more. Um, tell you what are your thoughts on WASM browsers and becoming kernels? Is this a snake eating its tail? Wrote so you earlier. Um, actually, WASM is quite interesting. So the problem with, I, I think really problem, uh, browsers get too complex. It's, it's, it's the same like the Linux kernel. They, everything in the kitchen thing, right? They throw everything in there. Uh, Java script, just in time compiling, all the rendering, uh, a lot of other stupid features like synchronization, pocket stuff, like nobody asked for, like Mozilla pocket crap. And all the features, even web fonts. I mean, sometimes there's also a limit of adding complexity. Web, web assembly, probably not too bad. And I said this before already, my dream system, if I would have all the time and spare time and money to write a dream system, I would probably JIT just in time compile the whole kernel and theoretically maybe even make it so, and maybe we try this soon or um, proof of concept, just in time compiling kernel, like maybe for a test, I mean, just, I mean, it works, right? It's not like it's impossible. Um, like using like web assembly kind of portable pre-compiled portable web assembly stuff to just in time compile it um, not only to run the same drivers on PowerPC and x86 which for the most part is just possible and where you need some endianess stuff you can still have some endianess helpers for the driver to explicitly do some endianess stuff and but also not only for PowerPC versus x86 or ARM, MIPS and so on, but for the most part also if you run um, stuff on other CPUs, right? Most of the time, so you compile software or your kernel with SSE2 or something, single instruction multiple data from a decade ago, because you want your kernel run on everything 
And most of the part you're not even using the latest CPU instructions like AVX, AVX 512 and all kind of other uh, special pop count um, bit manipulating first bit set and whatnot instructions that came later because your software is not hard coded pre-compiled for that. And I said this already before, this is really sad, right? So if you have like portable assembly just in time compile your whole kernel or at least the drivers, maybe not the micro kernel, but at least the drivers are user space, right? So you can just in time compile them and, or, and your or, uh, whole software, right? Is it not amazing you have um, your rate, rate recovery? Well, in the Linux kernel, of course, they have special rate recovery stuff for XORing and checksumming with SSE2 and AVX and stuff, but it's all explicitly coded, right? And if you would have, I said this, this is not a new idea for me. I said this, I have long videos discussing microkernel uh, concept drafting stuff there. I said this already six months ago or whenever that was, um, that I would think this is amazing, right? So you, you run your, you, you plug in a new CPU or you pull your SSD out and plug it into a new, new rig and it's automatically recompiling, just in time compiling for your latest AVX uh, 512 instruction, in my opinion. So it would be pretty amazing. And also even in C and C++, you need to wait for a new compiler and you need to recompile everything. And with this kind of system, you only would need a new JIT and the JIT having support for vectorizing, generating this new wider instruction and um, yeah, be done with it. And um, um, what else do we have there? Is there going to be always innovation? We had this already. So uh, Dave wrote, Linux is simply the case of verse is better. Look at the concept at Wikipedia. Do you think BSD OS is more secure? Had this open BSD is probably the only BSD that cares about security in the strict manner. Yeah, but um, yeah, as I said, um, I said additional reasons why I think they, well, not, they are not secure and they are not having a microkernel. They do not have more address space um, separation and stuff. So yeah, just curious cause uh, PEC BSD also says they really care about security very seriously and just bring art structure to their platform. Hmm. Dave says OpenBSD is much easier to use than other Unixes, in, my, in his humble opinion. Um, maybe for the fun stuff, we will just because install them just because to give you an overview. Of course, as I said at the university, I had a huge free, FreeBSD fan, and at Rock Linux, we always had people who were at Rock Linux back in the day and also used OpenBSD for firewall and networking stuff and stuff. Um, so. As I said, I always have seen a little bit. I've not really used FreeBSD and OpenBSD. I've installed them, tested them, but yeah, whatever. So like only test installed them. Um, Dragonfly, Dragonfly BSD, I, I test used a little bit more. Um, but again, to summarize this, my other point was for the drivers, of course, we could just reuse them. Um, it, they are just, for example, the Linux or BSD kernels, they are full, full with their specific API. You could either edit this away or which of course is usually also a huge amount of work, maybe especially for the first day, right? If you, the first year, you want to prototype some new microkernel system with more amazing user land, then um, it's probably easiest to write some shim layer like, like Linux compatibility stuff um, and run this in user space in, in sub processes there for storage and network if you wanted the stability and even why not? I mean, certainly open sources then. And, and even if you have a totally commercial system, the drivers are separated. In my opinion, probably for the most part, you could not a GPL violation, I would think, in my opinion. Anyway, just some, certainly for the huge graphic drivers, right? The, but even then, it's certainly really difficult. This is also why I made this video as introduction to Virgin Voodoo and fun stuff like that, because working on this really monstrous, humongous, uh, huge drivers that are hundred thousands, if not millions of codes, certainly if you combine all of AMD, AMD because especially AMD, not the, as much as I have to applaud them for the open source efforts, the kernel, the, the code lines are really many 
especially they have display abstraction, so they have some shared code with Windows or so, the display something DC, whatever that was, display, display code something. And so this is already only the display code for selecting, selecting display port and HDMI and all the link training and, and DRM, is it DRM, HTCP, um, copyright protection stuff. So all of this bloody mode setting already probably 100,000 codes for the modern AMD cards plus all the command validation and 3D, 2D stuff and Mesa and compiler for the compiling the fragment vertex shaders and stuff. So this code base, especially counting everything up to, well, including the LLVM compiler, certainly more than a million lines of code. So you see, if you really wanted to create such a system, certainly you would want to pull in some of those open source pieces, at least in the interim. But um, yeah, in my opinion, they also became a little bit too large. Somehow, in my opinion, I have the feeling that GPUs became a little bit too complex. I said this already before, maybe we would there better off with some more Intel B like many like many core x86 like 2480 like Xeon Phi of this B stuff of Intel um, that to have them more flexible programmable because nowadays it's quite fixed function with yeah programmable but it's the GPU's architecture is somehow like everything in the kitchen sink um, their old architecture if you look at Novo um, what we look for P3 RSX, the architecture from the first Riva TNT stuff is still there. So basically they have NV01, 2, 4, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 and only extended and blown up and something and yeah. And AMD the same. I read uh, Intel. Uh, Intel is, I just read the other day, for the most part, the micro architecture of the GPU is mostly the same. And now with the next generation, it's the first time since um, 965 or something from over 15 years ago. It's the first time they make major changes, apparently, allegedly, but uh, certainly something to take a closer look in a future video. But this kind of complexity is also what prevents new operating systems to make use of those. You see how long it takes in the Linux world to develop this. So yeah, there is where you driver reuse idea comes from and where you probably want to do this for at least quite some drivers, especially if you need graphics anyway. But yeah, reoccurring theme here, I wish stuff would be simpler. Maybe for the fun, scroll over the graphic GPU code of the Linux kernel, libdrm, Mesa and LLVM, the shader compiler stuff and think about this yourself. Um, we had this, so Intel had this concept with Larrabee, the IBM, Toshiba, Sony stuff had this with the cell, additionally to the NVIDIA RSX, but the cell was of course as flexible programmable there, this small cluster of single instruction multiple data. Maybe this would be all much more simpler, much more high performance, much more maintainable with all the crusty crafts that are the GPU drivers and silicon infrastructure. I hope you learned something. These are my thoughts for today. Leave me in the comments below what you think. Uh, also, if you watch this later, uh, so much more content here to do. Uh, thanks for subscribing. You see, even if you just maintain a basic overview, everything takes time and efforts. And this is, of course, just scratching very much on the surface here. So another video, we will certainly take a look in Haiku, Dragonfly. If you have other stuff that you want me to take a look at, leave it in the comments below. Otherwise, we will also continue with low-level code there for graphic stuff and virtualization stuff and certainly continue with our T2 Linux just to have a vanilla open source source distribution maintained that we are so familiar. And if it doesn't fail for our, on us with LVM2 and other kernel uh, random stuff here, then it's actually quite usable if pulls audio doesn't die or something of that sort. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a nice afternoon, night, morning, evening or something. And I hope to see you soon for all the next fun stuff to come.